Thank you, everyone. And it's a great pleasure and privilege to be here in person with everybody. How marvelous. And to share the floor with the marvelous Nick Ciro. Thank you, Nick, for everything you do. So um, I'm going to be talking about co compulsivity in the post-pandemic era. We're going to look at some new disorders, traits, models, interventions, and public health impact. I first should declare my interests, and I'm just very grateful to all the organizations who've supported my research and educational work over at least 30 years. <laughs> OK. So what are we talking about? We're talking about compulsivity. What do we mean by compulsivity? Well, compulsions are stereotyped behaviors. They're performed according to rigid rules, and they're designed to reduce or avoid unpleasant consequences. And arguably, obsessive compulsive disorder is the archetypal compulsive disorder, and as Nick has described, people with OCD will repeat unwanted precautionary behaviours, so they'll be washing or checking, together with very distressing, irrational, intrusive thoughts of harm. Will I spread COVID? Will I... Um, uh, will, if I don't check the front door, will I be burgled? Will I become a, a, a paedophile and molest a child? But a focus on compulsivity is also relevant for a broader spectrum of disorders that also exhibit compulsive behavior at their core. And we're talking about the compulsive spectrum disorders and also behavioral and substance addictions. And I'm gonna be talking about those later in this lecture. But as a whole, as we've heard from Nick, these lifespan disorders are extremely common, they're very difficult to treat, and they're responsible for considerable psychiatric, and we've heard some examples of depression, and very sadly, suicide, and physical health burden and cost to the individual and society as a whole. And I'd just like to contextualize Nick's comments about the cost of OCD per se by looking at the cost and burden of brain disorders in the UK, and I'm very grateful to the BAP for helping me with this analysis, but this looked at the cost of all brain disorders uh, to the UK economy, and we found that there were, uh, during this analysis, which was over 10 years ago now, uh, 45 million cases of brain disorder costing uh, about 130 billion, this was done in euros, euros per year, but the, the top five most costly brain disorders, all costing more than 10 billion euros a year to the UK, all fell within the field of psychiatry. Uh, it's all in quite small print, but we've got addiction and anxiety disorders there. Those are two, that, and those are the disorders where the disorders we're talking about fall in, a, in a addiction and anxiety. But also for completeness, we have dementia, mood disorders, and psychosis. So these are the top most costly brain disorders in the UK. So what am I going to do in this lecture? Well, I'd like to share with you some of the recent changes in diagnosis and classification of compulsive spectrum disorders that I think are of great relevance to public health. And then I'm going to go on a journey with you through some seminal examples of the role of bench-to-bedside neuroscience research that we hope was going to advance clinical interventions in the field, honing down on obsessive compulsive disorder, and then finally, in the last few slides, I'm going to show you the impact of obsessive compulsive symptoms and traits on post-pandemic adjustment and public health following the release of social restrictions and give you an opportunity as members of the public to participate yourselves in some ongoing citizen science research in extending this work in this field. And all the while, through the lecture, I hope we'll together be looking ahead to fresh research goals for advancing interventions for compulsive symptoms and disorders that we can then implement in new citizen science projects. <laughs> 
So what are compulsive spectrum disorders? Well, they share a number of common features, principle of which is this loss of behavioural control and the failure to regulate repetitive behaviours, which is experienced as profoundly distressing. These, this loss of control reflects a complex and dynamic interplay of motivations. If you're starting from the field of addiction, then it may be seeking reward that starts out the road to loss of control. You may be indulging in alcohol or gambling for a sense of pleasure, but then you lose control of that. If you're starting off with obsessive compulsive disorder, you are trying to relieve or avoid unpleasant consequences. But ultimately, whichever place you start at, it seems that these disorders converge ultimately on habitual loss of control. You do the behavior because you do the behavior and it just can't, you just can't stop it. They all share structural or functional or connectivity changes in anatomical brain areas involved in either processing emotions or in executive control of behavior. And nowadays, with the internet being so ubiquitous, many, if not all of them, are played out on the internet. And as a result of the work such as Nick was showing you, the cost and burden work in the field, the World Health Organization in its recent reclassification of mental disorders, the ICD-11, has subjective compulsive disorders to substantial diagnostic reclassification in order to aid recognition and treatment. And I thought I'd share with you some of these key changes. First of all, there's a whole new section devoted not just to OCD, but this new family of obsessive compulsive and related disorders that not only includes OCD, but body dysmorphic disorder, hoarding disorder, hair pulling and skin picking disorder, hypochondriasis, the obsessional fear of having something very seriously wrong with you, an olfactory reference disorder, a completely new diagnosis, the fear of smelling bad and offending people. But there's also a new section, a very exciting new section, of disorders due to addictive behaviours. So no longer is addiction restricted to substances, but there are behaviours you can become compulsively addicted to. And the two that feature in the ICD-11 are gambling disorder and gaming disorder, and I'll talk a bit about that. There's also a new disorder, which is a bit of a misnomer. It's called compulsive sexual behavior disorder, but it's an impulse control disorder. I don't have much time to talk about that, but maybe in the Q&A, if we've got time, we can cover that. And the internet is now included in the diagnostic classification as a, as a diagnostic specifier. So you can have online gambling or offline gambling, online gaming or online ga offline or online gaming. It'd be interesting to see whether there are differences in the uh, underpinning mechanisms and in the treatment outcomes. This is just one model which we might use if we're thinking of the taxonomy of obsessive compulsive related disorders. How do they fit in the way we view other mental health issues? And I see them as this bridge, a kind of archaeopteryx, neither bird nor reptile, spanning mood disorders on one side and addiction on the other side, with perhaps links with neurodevelopmental disorders uh, as well. Autism spectrum disorder, a uh, very uh, common uh, uh, neurodevelopmental disorder, has a lot of compulsive features uh, associated with it. But the three disorders I thought you might be most interested that I've picked out in blue, and I'll just give a couple of slides on them, are gaming disorder, hypochondriasis, and OCPD. What is OCPD? Well, it's obsessive compulsive personality disorder, all of which I think are highly relevant in today's post-pandemic world. So let's start with cyberchondria. Now, I don't expect many of you to know what cyberchondria is, but it's this new transdiagnostic, so it crosses diagnoses, digital compulsive syndrome that occurs a lot in hypochondriasis, the fear of having something wrong with you, but also in OCD. And it involves 
urge-driven, excessive searching for medical information on the internet. Of course, the searching is intended to reassure us, but you go down that rabbit hole, don't you? All it does is increase anxiety, uncertainty, and reinforce, reinforces checking. And it's associated with increased COVID-related fear, and it mediates, it's linked to linking this fear on increasing anxiety, depression, stress, and poor quality of life. And we'll talk about cyberchondria a little bit later. What about obsessive compulsive personality disorder? A disorder rather close to my heart. Um, it's people who from birth, essentially, have needed certainty and completeness and ideally perfect outcomes, but who sometimes come across as rather inflexible, stubborn, maybe judgmental, and self-critical and even uncollaborative, maybe take a long time to get things finished because they have to do it so perfectly, commonly co-occurs with people with obsessive compulsive and related disorders. And we're going to talk a little bit about that a little bit later. And finally, I thought I'd introduce gaming disorder because it's very exciting. We've got this new behavioral addiction. Uh, it's characterized by impaired control over gaming, which is given increased priority. You continue doing it despite knowing that it's causing you irrevocable harm. And these harms include harms to personal or family relationships, education, of course, it's often children and adolescents who are hooked. Their grades go down, their parents are tearing their hair out. And so the ICD, the World Health Organization, thought it was really important to recognize this disorder. And in case any of you are suffering with either gaming or other forms of problematic use of the internet, I'd like to commend this self-help book to you. It's freely available, downloadable from the cost action website internetandme.eu and it provides information on PUI, all the sorts of different disorders, social media addiction, porn addiction, etc., and provides you with practical tips of how to manage it. If you can't get this written down, by all means email me after this lecture and I'll happily provide you the link. But going back to spectrums, not only are there spectrums of different disorders, but important spectrums to think about are severity spectrums. Spectrums, let's say, of severity of OCD. So we've heard from Nick that OCD is pretty prevalent, and in this Zurich prospective epidemiological study looking out at people prospectively as they develop obsessive compulsive symptoms, 3.5% of this Swiss population developed OCD. But another approximately 10% developed something called obsessive compulsive syndrome, which isn't quite as bad as OCD, but it has sort of some of the cardinal hallmark symptoms. And yet another 10% had obsessive compulsive symptoms. Now I'll hold my hand up, I'm probably in that group. Before I go away on holiday, I find myself cleaning the kitchen surfaces and changing the towel in the downstairs toilet, which really enrages the rest of the family. But these are not pathological, these are just obsessive compulsive symptoms. Uh, so overall, these syndromes and symptoms disorder affect about 20% of the population, so it's really very common. Are they linked to one another? Well, the beauty of this prospective study is we could look at age of onset, and irrespective of whether you had symptom or syndrome or disorder, they seem to follow the same trajectory in terms of when they come on. The symptom, syndromes, or disorder all come on sort of just before the age of 10, between about the age of 20 or so, just when Nick was talking about how his came on. You've, it's very rare to develop these disorders or symptoms over the age of 30. So these are early onset problems, which talks of this link perhaps with neurodevelopmental disorders. How do we treat OCD? Well, we've heard you can treat it with cognitive behavior therapy, with exposure and response prevention. You need a lot of time to do it. It's a very difficult treatment. You have to face your fears and learn to disregard your urges to do your compulsions and just hold the anxiety and wait for it to extinguish. And we'll talk about reasons why people find it so hard, but in my experience, about half my patients just really can't do it.
The alternative is to try medication. We have selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They're the first-line medical treatment. They're broad-spectrum treatments. You've probably heard about them. They treat depression, anxiety, and they also are very effective in OCD, as is clomipramine, the treatment that Nick mentioned, an older tricyclic antidepressant that also acts on this chemical serotonin in the brain. For OCD, unlike depression, we need higher doses. We need to treat people for longer. And for those who don't respond to these treatments, adding in a treatment that acts on a different chemical system, dopamine, can sometimes be helpful. In many cases with severe illness, we combine both these two forms of treatment, though we don't know whether combination is any better than either on its own. But, and here's the rub, around 40% of people fail to respond at all. We have no reliable outcome predictor, so I can't say if you come into my clinic whether I should be giving you CBT or medication. There's no way of telling. Even if you're lucky enough to respond, it's usually only partial. And relapse, as we've heard, is extremely common. You're never really out of the woods. So we need more efficacious, personalized treatment. And this, I believe, is where trans translational neuroscience research comes in to help us understand the mechanisms underpinning the disorders that we can use as new treatment targets and to look at biomarkers, uh, objective, reliable markers that can tell us this person needs this treatment, whereas this person needs another treatment. So in our research into obsessive compulsive disorders, we've applied this latent marker model and it's proved extremely profitable for our research. And I'll share it with you. It's based on the premise that we have the causes and drivers of the disorders here at the bottom, that you may have it in your family, so your genes may program you. Environmental, we've heard you may have a child that may trigger it. And then we have the symptoms of all these compulsive disorders, behavioral addictions, OCD, and so on, very variable, hard to differentiate sometimes. In between, between the genetic drivers, we have changes in the brain which result in thinking changes which cause the disorders. And where we've targeted our efforts is to try and link, find out what the thinking changes associated with the disorders are, and then map the brain changes onto the thinking changes to see if we can develop some new treatments. So what I'm going to talk about, I'll just, it'll be a very brief gallop through, but I wanted you to share the experience of doing this research with me. But it'll all be, a lot of what I'm talking about is, um, is described in more detail in this book that recently came out, and I'd like to acknowledge Professor Trevor Robbins and his team at Cambridge University, who over the last 15 years or so has worked with me uh, on this project of unraveling the neuroscience of OCD. Now, what we're really talking about is a brain in disequilibrium. Uh, here's our brain, and uh, the brain is designed to do things. We have to breathe to survive. We have to act to survive. Our purposeful behaviors are controlled by, this, by our cortex, our, our prefrontal cortex, our judgment or governor of the brain, which, if you like, is the brake on the system, and there are bottom-up drives from the internal, deep-down parts of the brain, if you like, the accelerator, the gas on the system, that are constantly prompting our brain to do things. And it has to be kept under control by our cortices. And we believe that in these compulsive disorders, there's a disequilibrium or an imbalance in this control process. Either there's just not enough break, or there's too much gas, or there's a bit of both. Now, of course, it isn't quite as simple as that, but this is another rather simplistic view of the systems that we think are important in the brain underpinning these compulsive disorders. We think that the symptoms and thinking problems uh, can be reflected as disordered structure or connectivity or function in these three large-scale brain networks. So you can see the brain just behind, and you can see these three networks, the parallel circuits for the control of emotion, thought, 
an action. So here we have the emotional circuit or the reward circuit. So it's a money bag. Is a, is a behavior worth doing? Should I invest my time in doing it? Will it reward me? It goes from the medial cortex, prefrontal cortex, down through the ventral, the belly of the brain and back up. And it interlinks very closely with a slightly more lateral to the side, the thinking control circuit, the cognitive circuit, which is, well, if a behavior is worth doing, how do I do it most efficiently to get the result I want? That's what that circuit codes for. And that interlinks with the further back circuit, which is also quite high up in the brain, the premotor cortex, which is the fine tuning of the motor behavior. Um, uh, this is the, the part of the brain that codes for uh, tics uh, and uh, habit formation. And we think these three key systems are important in underpinning obsessive compulsive and related disorders. So how do we search for the thinking changes upon which we've got to map these brain changes? Well, we tend to nowadays use computerized cognitive batteries, and they have potential advantages over pen and paper uh, puzzles uh, they can, because they, they consistently apply the same task. We can fractionate, we can divide thinking processes into component constituents, and we can use these tests in the brain scanner. So we can actually look at brain functioning whilst people are being challenged to see what parts of the brain are working or not working that well during the conduct of the task. They're also adaptable for translational purposes, so you can adapt these tasks for use in animals to see if the same problems pertain and test out your hypotheses uh, in other species. And I thought I'd just show you one of these tasks so you can experience with me what one of these tasks, doing one of these tasks is like. And this is a very relevant task. This is the intra-extra dimensional set shift task, which is a task of inflexible, stubborn thinking. Very relevant for the field we're talking about. And what we do is we, we, we present these paired pairs of compound stimuli to the participant on a screen. So their compound is much as a two stimuli here. There's a shape and there's a line, and there's a different shape and a different line. And the participant is asked to, through trial and error, work out which is the most important dimension. And it happens to be, let's say, pink shapes, and it's this sort of uh, inverted cube shape. And every time they see that shape, they have to press a button, and they get a yes, and they realize it's right. And then, of course, cruelly, the, the shapes change, and they've got to unlearn the rule that it was this shape and adapt to the new rule and learn that it's a new shape. Let's say it's this fox head shape, pink shape. And most people with OCD, most people manage to do that fairly well. But then the harder part is, after a while, you ch the rule changes again, all the shapes change, but it's no longer shapes that the person has to respond to, it's lines. Let's say it's this tomahawk-shaped white line. And most people, after a while, realize, oh gosh, I've got to it's not shapes anymore, it must be lines. But the poor people with OCD, not only the people with OCD, their first-degree relatives, their brothers and sisters and fathers and children, have great difficulty leaving shapes and moving to lines. And his result, and Sam Chamberlain, who we've heard, did this research. It's a long time ago, Sam. Uh, but it's really important research, which showed that not only the patients in the navy blue, but their unaffected first-degree relatives. So their relatives didn't have OCD, but they were pretty poor at doing this flexible shifting task. Now, I've said to you, what do we do? We put them in the brain scanner to find out what part of the brain is affected. And here we have, this is functional magnetic resonance imaging. Now, we've changed the task. It's not, it's not uh, shapes and lines. It's faces and, how, and houses. You can just see a house superimposed on the face. And this is testing when the rule changes from pressing for faces to pressing for houses. And this is a horizontal section through the brain. Here we have the front of the brain, here we have the back of the brain. The yellow bits are the bits that everyone activates during that complicated process of unlearning the previous rule and learning the new rule. And the blue bits are the parts of the brain here in the lateral prefrontal cortex, the, cortic, the cognitive control loop, where people with OCD and their first degree relatives failed to activate 
that part of the cortex. So we've started to link a part of the brain's circuit and its function with a propensity, a vulnerability to OCD. Now let's fast forward uh, many years, uh, and here we have Matilda Vaggi also working with Trevor Robbins in Cambridge. The technology has improved a lot. We're still interested in this cognitive control circuit, but we're now able to do resting state magnetic resonance imaging to look at the connectivity within the whole circuit that goes from cortex to the deeper structures. We give the patients the IDED task, and this is their performance in terms of the errors they make. Now, not everyone is bad at the task. That's the first thing to say. Most people do okay on it, but there's this group of about 40% who have a lot of errors, who are very inflexible in thinking. And when we look at their connectivity scores, these are the people who make the high errors and they have low decreased functional connectivity within the cognitive, within the thinking control circuit. So we've shown that inflexible thinking within the OCD population is linked with problems with that thinking control circuit in the brain. But of course, OCD is not about just being inflexible and stop, you know, not being able to, to shift set and just carrying on doing things. It's this, um, it's this complex interaction between uh, inflexibility and anxiety that's epitomized by the inflexible harm-related compulsions and obsessions that we see in OCD that we've got to get to grips with. And that takes us back to the reward area of the brain, the medial prefrontal cortex, which is very important not only for computing whether something is worth doing, but risk as well. Is something worth avoiding? Is it going to have damaging, dangerous consequences for me? And we as humans need to be able to flexibly adapt through our medial, medial prefrontal cortex to generate flexible behavior as contingencies a.k.a. risks change. Now, we've capitalized on this concept of fear reversal, which looks at a once threatening stimulus, which becomes safe in order to test the capacity to flexibly update in our minds something that used to be dangerous as now being safe. And to understand inflexible safety processing in OCD, we studied how fear responses are flexibly updated as risks change. And this is work by my other colleague, uh, Anamika apergis Shooter, who was also working in Cambridge at the time, is now working in Leicester. Now, this is a complicated slide. It's kind of purposely complicated because it is a bit complicated, but I'm going to make it simple for you by taking you through the slide. So here was our hypothesis. People with OCD are going to be inflexible at updating, at renewing threat and safety expectancy, and that's going to be linked to malfunctioning in the reward brain circuit. So that's our hypothesis. So we took some OCD patients and we took some healthy controls, and what did we do? We, we put them in front of a computer and we showed them grumpy faces. Grumpy faces catch your attention. And we linked the purple grumpy face with a very minor electric shock, like a little TENS machine, a little buzz. It was enough to cause discomfort, but it wasn't very painful. But it was enough to make you sweat if you knew it was coming. So the purple face was followed a few milliseconds later by a little shock, whereas the green face was safe. And we measured whether patients and healthy controls anticipated the threat in the normal way by measuring how much they sweated when presented with these faces through skin conductance, so a little electrode on their skin. And here we have the results. Blue, patient, blue people are the healthy controls, purple people are the OCD patients, and the dark bar is uh, when you get the shocking face, and the uh, pale bar is when you get the unshocking face. And what we found was whether you had OCD or not, you sweated when you saw the purple face because you knew you were going to get a shock, and you didn't sweat when you saw the green face because you knew you weren't. And then we did the reversal. What does the reversal mean? It feels very cruel. We changed the rule. So it was the green face that became the shocking face, and the purple face was safe. And we looked to see whether people could update 
their threat expectancy, ignore the previous threats associated with the purple face and respond now to the green face. And what we found was the healthy controls managed it really well, but people with OCD were flummoxed. They still responded to the purple face, which, and they said to us, we knew it's safe, but they still responded to it by sweating as though it was still dangerous. And I think that talks to what Nick was telling us about this distress. My mind is telling me it's safe, but my brain is responding as though it's still dangerous. Terribly distressing, but very confusing. So inflexible evaluation of previously threatening stimuli following reversal. So even though you know it's no longer dangerous, you're responding as though it still is. And of course, what did we do? We put the people into the brain scanner and our hypothesis is going to be linked to the reward circuit. And Geronimo, here we are here. This is actually a vertical slice through the brain. This is in the medial prefrontal, the reward uh, circuit cortex and OCD patients showed overactivation in this area of the brain, which was linked to their following failure to update during reversal. Now, it was happening during the early stages of fear learning, where their sweating responses looked normal, but what was going on in, in their brain was really very different. And it meant, because of this early activation, it meant that later, when they were presented with the purple face, which was safe, the healthy controls generated a safety signal, relief relabeling it, we said, that when they saw it, they knew it was safe. But the OCD patients no, didn't have the relief relabeling, which explained why they still felt it was dangerous. So I think we'll just summarize things for a moment, because I've taken you through a lot of complicated stuff, just to remind you that what we've seen is that we have inflexible safety learning in people with OCD. They fail to update threat expectancies. So once a threatening stimulus becomes safe, they still think it's dangerous, and that's linked with hyperactivity in the reward circuit, overactivity. At the same time, remember the previous studies showed inflexible rule-based behavior linked with reduced connectivity in the thinking circuits, the cognitive control loops. We think this is a state marker for obsessive compulsive symptoms, how ill you are. And this, remember the relatives had it as well, is probably a vulnerability mark. If you have that, you're vulnerable to developing it. Now, as an aside, Inflexible responding to changing threats has a lot of implications. Firstly, let's think about if you're someone with OCD and you're having CBT and you're expected to learn to extinguish anxiety, but your brain is telling you something that was once dangerous still is. It might explain why it's so difficult to do exposure and response prevention. And it's also going to be really important when we think about post-pandemic adjustment. And I'll come on to that in just one moment. But before I do, the whole point of all this work is to look to see if we can identify targets for treatment. So can we modify the circuitry abnormalities to aid recovery? So back to our cartoon. Here we have our circuits. And these flashes are those areas of the brain where we intervene using neurostimulation. We either give deep brain stimulation, electrodes implanted deep in the brain, or we stimulate the cortex through the scalp, not through uh, surgical procedures. And these are the areas that have worked in OCD. Now, it's not like ECT, where somebody has a very large shock. They're, they're anesthetized. People are awake. These are very small, focused electric currents. So I'll first just show you quickly. I've just got a couple of slides just to show you the results of deep brain stimulation. And we've been looking at stimulating the emotional and the cognitive circuits in extremely severe refractory OCD. These are people who've been ill for more than 20 years, and they were scoring nearly 40 out of 40 on our OCD scale. So very severe, usually hospitalized people. Just six people had this, because this involves implanting electrodes. This is still an experimental treatment. Again, it's a complicated slide, but don't worry, I'll take you through it. We implanted the electrodes in both circuits, the cognitive circuit and the emotional circuit. We showed here at the baseline, here are OCD symptoms, the baseline people are nearly scoring up maximum. Very quickly, irrespective of whether we stimulated the thinking circuit or the emotional circuit, their symptoms reduced by about half. 
Combining stimulation, both centers didn't really matter, and we eventually gave them CBT, but that added little benefit, and we have Lynn Drummond in the audience, who was part of the experiment, who gave the CBT, and I'm sure she'd be happy to talk a little bit about that, but it seemed, the improvements seemed to be related to stimulation. But here's the very interesting thing, that depressed mood only responded when we stimulated the reward circuit, whereas Cognitive inflexibility, inflexible thinking, only responded when we stimulated the thinking circuit. So we've passed, we've fractionated our OCD. It's not just one thing anymore, or treatment isn't just one thing. We can improve OCD by stimulating either circuits, but we can improve mood by stimulating the emotional loop, flexibility, stimulating the cognitive loop, which means that now perhaps we can test out if you've got someone with depression, you may be able to personalize this. Let's say we put this in the emotional circuit, whereas if they've got cognitive inflexibility, we might think about stimulating the other circuit. But as I've said, we can't put in electrodes in the brains of everybody with OCD. We wouldn't want to. OCD is extremely common, so we need scalable up treatments. How about using these non-invasive mechanisms of neurostimulation? And this is very, very new work. It hasn't even been published yet, so it comes with all those caveats. Professor Baldwin was part of the team. Nick Ciro was part of the team. Um, we looked at transcranial direct current stimulation in a small number of people with OCD, and we stimulated using very tiny currents just over a couple of days, either the orbitofrontal, so it's the reward loop, and this time we chose the motor loop as the comparison, and we gave a sham stimulation as a control. And I'm very grateful to the National Institute for Health Research for funding this study. As I say, the results are unpublished, so they haven't been subject to peer review, but I wanted to share them with you at the earliest opportunity, because this is citizen science. I think it's important for you to see what we found. So the most important thing, I think, was a very strongly positive attitude amongst the participants. They, they enjoyed being part of the process, and they even thought that home-based application of this stimulation might be acceptable to them, because it was very simple to apply was safe and well tolerated. We found, as it happened, that only stimulating the orbitofrontal cortex, but nevertheless stimulating it only for a short time, did produce improvement in obsessive compulsive symptoms and depression compared to sham. Uh, blue is the orbitofrontal, sham is green, and brown is, is stimulating the motor cortex, which didn't really uh, uh, cause much improvement. So our next steps, now we think that the orbitofrontal, the reward circuit is, is the place to go. It improves mood as well. So we'd like to run a much bigger study. So we're going to go back to our funders uh, to see if we can investigate TDCS as a treatment for, oops, for OCD. But finally, in my last two or three minutes of this lecture, <laughs> I'd like to talk a little bit about, we've talked about home-based treatment, but I want to talk about people, we've heard from Nick, people who are stuck at home uh, since this terrible pandemic that we've all been through. We're all traumatized by it, but some people have been traumatized more than others. So this was an article I lifted from the Sunday Telegraph only a few weeks ago, talking about people having great difficulty adjusting following the release of lockdown. And anybody wants any details, it's in these couple of papers that have been uh, published recently in the Journal of Psychiatric Research. Now, cast your minds back to June to October 2020. A bit hard to do so, but that was the first release of lockdown. And it was kind of euphoric time. We thought we were out of the woods, little did we know. We were encouraged, the government was telling us to eat out, and they were paying us to eat out and get the economy going as, again, if you remember. And we sent this survey around because we noticed amongst our patients and amongst our friends and our family, there were some people who were finding it really hard. So after, now lockdown is easing. Are you having trouble adjusting? <laughs> And we assessed people's ability to adjust, and we asked about mental status, history of mental illness, and all, all the usual things you'd think you might ask them. And what did we find? We found that there were a lot of new cases of obsessive compulsive syndromes that had arisen during the pandemic. So in people who had not had any mental disorder before, about 20% of them were endorsing symptoms consistent with OCD. 
we found that a substantial proportion of the, of the people, public, 25%, were struggling to readjust following the release of lockdown and were experiencing symptoms of depression, anxiety, stress, and fear of COVID. And it wasn't a level playing field. Some people were disproportionately disadvantaged. And these were anybody who'd had a history of mental disorder, those who had obsessive compulsive symptoms, and the particular symptoms were those who washed, checked, and had cyberchondria, our old friend cyberchondria, or our new friend cyberchondria, and those with obsessive compulsive personality traits perfectionist, rigid, conscientious people who are finding the change in rules really difficult. And of course, what did we do? We, of course, sent them online, our intradimensional, extra-dimensional set shift task. And perhaps not surprisingly, those who were having difficulty adjusting also showed inflexibility on the set shifting task. So we think these are red flags to identify those at risk, what do we do with this information then? Well, this is a public health issue, so we've got to generate public health solutions. Truth is, we really don't know. I don't know anybody who's really systematically talking about this. I think we need to think about public health and education. Of course, we should, I mean, these are kind of obvious things that you might come up with. They need to be tested, encourage balanced risk and safety evaluation, improve online health information and literacy so we're making accurate judgments, certainly discourage cyberchondria. And I understand why people are going online. It's really hard to see a GP nowadays. Um, and so for that reason, people might be you know, resorting to the internet, which might not always be helpful. And I think we may have to get away from a one-size-fits-all message about COVID. That was totally appro appropriate when the COVID broke out. But now risks are not quite the same. We maybe need more nuanced messaging. And for those who are at risk, perhaps clear, unequivocal messaging about when and how to stop avoiding and letting go of these behaviours, which may change. It's going to have to be flexible. In terms of clinical interventions, the clinicians among you, or if you've got mental health problems and you're at risk yourself, you know, notice it. These are red flags and intervene before avoidance becomes habitual because the writing on the wall is that these problems are unlikely to go away. In the presence of depression or OCD or hypochondriasis, I'd recommend thinking about CBT or SSRI, but we need to think about other less well evidence-based behavior interventions. These usually fall within the field of occupational therapy, activity scheduling, having reasons to bring you out of the house, structure to your day, to entice you away from your rituals. A lot of people are still awake during the night and asleep during the day, getting people back into the normal di diurnal rhythms. And maybe other forms of habit reversal therapy for whom avoidance has now just become a habit. I don't go out because I'm habituated to not going out. So I actually help them break those habits. So I promised you an opportunity to engage in research. I'm now going to ask you to turn on your mobile phones. Normally we say turn them off. If any of you would like to help us, we're repeating, we're replicating our experiments during the release of lockdown now. So if you'd like to help us, I've delayed the closure of this experiment to today in case any of you'd like to join in. This QR code will link you to the participant info of the project and do help us uh, complete our research to see if the same problems pertain. So in conclusion, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Compulsivity underpins a broad spectrum of common, costly, and disabling brain disorders. OCD remains the archetypal one and the most well understood, but there are many other disorders there. Compulsivity is also linked to problems adjusting to threat, changing threat among the wider public, impinging on health and well-being in the post-pandemic landscape. And I would put it to you that bench to bedside research based on citizen science principles is now accumulating to improve our understanding of the biological mechanisms, develop new interventional targets, and generate 
new modalities of intervention and treatment. And I'd like to thank all of you. I, ideally, I would have the, all my patients up there. Of course, that would be unethical. So instead, second best, all my collaborators, thanks to all of you for making this work possible. Thank you. Fifteen minutes for questions and answers. I, okay, over to you. Hello. Uh, thank you very much. That's very helpful. And uh, Naomi, particularly the two slides you had about how uh, OCD or compulsive spectrum bridges the bit between, you know, compulsive behaviors and, and mood disorders. And also that uh, other slide with the money bags and the other two. Uh, so that was very, very helpful. A bit of a, uh, by, by the way, uh, I also started, I have to confess, I also started psychiatry on the 1st of August. <laughs> <laughs> I just feel really You're weird. a survivor. <laughs> a survivor. Um, I was going to ask about where childhood, you know, childhood abuse uh, fits into those two kind of uh, okay. <clears throat> diagrams and how childhood abuse interferes with compulsive kind of spectrum. Phones. So, Naomi. Yeah, well, it's a really great question. I'm minded, as flashed into my mind, uh, Nick talking about his EMDR uh, treatments, which is a treatment that's usually used for, for post-traumatic states. The truth is, though, we don't have a good signal uh, for certainly for obsessive compulsive disorder and traumatic experiences in childhood. So um, I can't really, you know, you'd think there would be, but there, there it really isn't a signal. Now that might be because the research, the research isn't very good in that area. What we really need are longitudinal studies that plot that everything is about, ret the problem is retro the retrospectoscope, looking retrospectively back. What I think we need to answer your question honestly would be prospective studies taking cohorts looking at the generation of symptoms and traumatic experiencing happening at that time and it wouldn't surprise me if we don't see links but at the moment I, 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 there isn't good strong evidence I, I can answer your question. Okay with. thank you very much Naomi. The gentleman there in the middle. Um, two questions really. Um, one is about classification and that is about um, impulse control disorders. You, you noted one, Naomi particularly, um, uh, is there a different ICD definition for impulse control disorders that wasn't on the screen there? And second question is, uh, what are the, what's the difference between addiction and OCD effectively? Because sometimes I think they're similar and then I realize they're probably not. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent question. So impulse control disorders are a separate group of disorders. Compulsive sexual behavior disorder, which is the uh, uncontrollable urge to engage in sexual behaviours is one of them. It's a new disorder. Other ones that you may well be a bit more familiar with are disorders like kleptomania, so the urge to steal, pyromania, the urge to set fires. And many of these end up in the forensic, in the criminal justice system, because the behaviours are often antisocial. But that's different from OCD. But some of the similar mechanisms may, the poor impulse control, may underpin these disorders. So I suppose what I'm trying to say is that the way we, the way we carve up these disorders is changing all the time. And the more we understand the mechanisms, we may carve them up differently in the future. What's different between addiction and compulsion? I've got to be very quick. Addiction mm. normally starts with engaging in a behavior that's actually rewarding. Yeah. And then changes happen in the brain that make you adjust, tolerate it, and so you've got to keep doing it in order to avoid craving. So you're doing it to stop feeling bad, whereas OCD starts with doing it to stop feeling bad right from the beginning. Does that make sense? Okay, so Judith. Thanks very much for a very interesting talk. Um, I'd be interested to hear where you thought pharmacological therapies were going with um, OCD. Um, obviously mentioned SSRIs and potentially the psychogenics. Or where, what, where, which do you view with most optimism? <laughs> well, I wonder if it should be me or Nick. Yeah, I think Nick. Yeah. Nick you, you mean on new pharmacotherapies? 
Well, I think the, the big thing at the moment is glutamate, you know, so you're, you might be aware of the Biohaven study, which is happening at the moment. Uh, Biohaven is an American biopharmaceutical company. Uh, they have a glutamate modulator called, if I can pronounce it correctly, Trorilluzol. Uh, not very easy oh, yeah. to pronounce, but basically it works in glutamate. And uh, they did a phase two study, uh, which didn't quite show statistical significance, oh. but they believed it was because they just didn't have enough patients in there. And so they're now doing a phase three study. So they're recruiting in the US, in the UK, I think in Italy, in Spain, and in the Netherlands and all that. Um, so, you know, hopefully there, there will be some kind of things in there. And I've also uh, set up a, a biotech, which is also looking at uh, similar kind of mechanisms, basically. And, uh, you know, we will see, you know, hopefully it might lead to something. And then obviously there's uh, psychedelics, you know, I mean, as we discussed, psilocybin, uh, psychedelics are all over Netflix at the moment. There's the new, uh, you know, series with Michael Pollard, or I can't remember exactly how you pronounce his name. Mm. Um, and uh, they're looking at things like, uh, you know, psilocybin, LSD, there's Beckley psycho psychedelics looking at all that. Uh, there's DMT also, very powerful psychedelic, which is being looked at. Uh, and so the study that we're financing happening here at Imperial College is a feasibility study. Uh, I think it's 10 milligrams of, um, of psilocybin, you know, to see whether there's any kind of signal or whatever. Um, now, we get, uh, just uh, very quickly, uh, you know, at Orchard, we get contacted uh, weekly by people saying, should I be taking magic mushrooms to treat my OCD? <laughs> and our answer is a no, that it has to be part of a controlled study, basically, and that we still don't really know whether this works or not. Good. Thank you, Judy. Um, gentleman over there, you have the microphone. Very nice talk. I can personally relate to it, particularly with the exposure response prevention. Two or three tears fell over my eyes when I tried this therapy, being an OCD survivor myself. So nice talk. And I have one question. So there is something called Tourettic OCD. I don't know whether you've heard about it. The thing is, I'm a survivor of Tourette's syndrome and obsessive compulsive disorder. And uh, I read some things that Tourette's OCD being different than normal OCD. Is, it, is there like something which, because when you normally put patients in the scanner, do some of them have tics as well? Okay. So, Naomi, do you want to answer the question Absolutely. about the Tourette's? Yeah. Well, tic-related OCD is a particular slightly different form of OCD that doesn't respond quite as well to treatment just with, S from a pharmacological point of view, treatment with just with SSRI. You usually need to use a dopamine antagonist, uh, so it acts on a different system alongside the SSRI to get the benefit. Um, Brain scanning studies do show that, that separate out those with and without tick do show subtle differences in the brain systems of people with and without tick. Um, normally, the presence of tick is something we would look for and we would try and homogenize our group. So if we're looking for tick, we'd, we'd, we'd rate for it and include it. Mostly, we don't include tick in these studies. Thank you, Naomi, and thank you for being so open and sharing your experience. Um, lady in the front. Yeah, thank you for the talk, and maybe I missed it, but so OCD, sort of the onset of OCD tends to be towards late, late adolescence, kind of early 20s. Do you sort of have an idea of what's happening in the brain around that age as to why sort of these thoughts start to kind of happen? Well, it, it, it's hard to know. I mean, there's, there's a suggestion that this is a neurodevelopmental problem. This is at a time when synaptic remodeling is happening. It's a time when many mental disorders have their origins round about this time. Precisely why people get OCD so early is, is, is hard to say at the moment, but that's, that's the time it, come, it comes on. Thank you. Thank you. At the back... Um, hi, yeah, thank you for such an interesting talk. Um, I, yeah, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit to the presentation of OCD that you might expect to see in the older adult population. So OCD rarely starts de novo in adults. When it does, you always have to think about whether there's another organic process going on. Uh, but any kind 
of OCD, in my experience, can present in adulthood. Often it just carries on throughout the, life, throughout the lifespan. Uh, it waxes and wanes. It doesn't tend, in, again, anecdotal, because we don't have these longitudinal studies that, that we really need to have, but anecdotally, it doesn't tend to get very much worse in, adult, in older age, but the same sorts of problems still pertain. So it could be checking, it could be harm, but it could still be paedophile. OCD, even in, the age, in an 80-year-old, I've seen. Thank you. I was going to ask Nick, actually, if that's OK. Um, you talked about your experience, and it sounded very much like a kind of um, an episodic condition. Whereas when Naomi and I started psychiatry, we were told that OCD was a, a chronic condition that waxes and waned in intensity but never goes away fully. So I was just wondering, based on your experience of, uh, you know, your, your kind of, your self-help groups and uh, the, the people who are affiliated to your organisation, what, what's your sense about the condition in terms of the proportion of episodic versus chronic? Well, in our support group, most people it's chronic, you know, yeah. and uh, we have some of our members, um, they remember just their whole life from their first memories of age three, they can remember having obsessive thoughts, you know. Um, I know um, there's uh, one person I know quite well, uh, Ethan from the International OCD Foundation, uh, who's done a lot of advocacy and all that on OCD. Uh, he says he's had it his whole life, you know. Yeah. So a lot of our patients, but um, I, I, myself, um, it's been kind of relapsing, remitting, or whatever you want to call it. I mean. Um, and, um, but um, I remember one of our members actually, um, she uh, developed OCD in her late 30s following a very painful divorce. And she used to come every month to our group, uh, you know, and she was suffering from severe depression and she was, say, and she was there saying, I'm gonna get better and it's never gonna come back. And um, then she just disappeared. And six months ago, she came back to our group on Zoom and she says, I'm better. It has completely gone, you know. Um, who knows, it might come back, you know, we have no idea. But there are, you know, occasionally we do come across, you know, people for whom it's just disappeared. Now, the problem is most of them don't come back to our group, you know, because actually once they've got better, they don't want to know anything about OCD. It was so traumatic. They're just like, I want to keep on with my life and all that. So yeah. we don't really know. So in our group, I guess we mainly have the chronic ones who keep coming back. Uh, thank you very much, first of all. It's very informative. Um, my question is, do you think there is an evolutionary reason for OCD? Do you think it might have been advantageous at some point to be OCD um, or addicted? Uh, do you think it might have been an adaptation? As with most mental disorders, there is an evolutionary hypothesis for OCD that it's really important to have these behaviours hardwired into our brains, to be meticulous and clean and to avoid risk, etc. And I hope what I've shown you today is that the behaviour of OCD is not crazy or psychotic in any way. It's just an, an exaggeration of normal behavior. So I guess, um, you know, it can be quite reassuring to think that actually these behaviors have some evolutionary advantage in some other world. It's just they're no longer, I, th I think it's important to remember that they're no longer adaptive uh, and that that kind of approach isn't always reassuring to patients uh, because it's just such hell having OCD now. I don't, I don't know. You know, I completely agree. There's, I remember a few years ago, actually, uh, reading a book called A First Rate Madness, I think it was called. And uh, it was kind of examples of how a certain kind of you know, famous figures had mental health disorders and how it actually been beneficial for them and all that. Um, there was not a single example of OCD in there. You know, not a single example. Um, it, it, when, when I got very bad six years ago, I remember my brother saying, you know, there's nothing good coming out of this. You have to really try and get some meaning out of it, you know, and hence setting up Orchard and all that kind of stuff. But I know nobody with OCD who's actually uh, said, somehow or other, it's helped me. Um, People on the public kind of think it does. Like this friend of mine said, oh, you must be really organized and disciplined and all that. And it's like, that is a complete trivialization and stereotypation or whatever the word is <laughs> of OCD. There's, I know nobody with OCD who will say that anything good has come out of it or that there's any evolutionary or whatever advantage to it. It's okay. generally just suffering and torment, I'm okay. sorry to say. So I think we must have our last question from 
person in the middle in the green. Yeah. Um, uh, just a quick question about the Apergis shoot study of 2017 that you mentioned about the um, behavioral changes or, yeah. Um, and I was wondering, I might have just missed this. Was it just specifically for those who experience a more anxiety driven version of OCD? And if so, um, if for the more addictive kinds, um, would you expect the same results or would you expect them perhaps even to adjust quicker because they're driven by such goal driven, that, yeah, the impulses are more goal driven? Um, well, thank you for that wonderful question. I was wondering if anybody would follow my slides, and so I'm so pleased that you followed it. And you've asked a, a really interesting question. The truth is, we don't know. Those people just had ordinary OCD. They didn't have behavioral addictions, they had OCD. The question in our mind is, would the same apply to other kinds of compulsive spectrum disorders? And we just don't know until we do the experiments. We guess that those that have got cognitive inflexibility and anxiety associated, so maybe hypochondriasis, you might hypothesize that they would respond in a similar way. Body dysmorphic disorder might, whereas, I don't know, gaming disorder might not. But until we do the study, the truth is we don't know. But thank you, it's a, a, a very interesting question. I think what I'd like to do now, I just invite Naomi to mention a, a very important publication. So we have in our audience Professor Lynn Drummond, who is emeritus, um, <laughs> who ran with me the National OCD Service out of Springfield Hospital, and she's written this marvellous Everything You Need to Know About OCD book. So for those of you who might yourselves know someone with OCD and like to, to find out about this book, there are flyers there on the, on the floor. Do, do take one home. Thank you. Well done. So thank you all for the fantastic questions and the great answers. And um, thank you for coming here on a, 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 a weekday evening. Well, undoubtedly, you have a long day. <laughs> so thank you for making the time to do that. Dr. Nick Siro, it was fantastic to hear about your experience. We wish you success in your endeavors in raising awareness uh, of this condition and developing new treatments. So thank you for taking part in the meeting today. Naomi Feinberg, thank you for another magisterial presentation. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye.